You ready for the word? If you're taking notes today, you can write this down. This is the title of our conversation. Stop blushing. Turn to your neighbor and say, hey, stop blushing. Turn to your other neighbor that you just ignored and say, hey, you, you stop blushing too. And if you're single and you're sitting next to your crush, you're welcome. We're going to take a look at a, at a statement in scripture today that's out of Romans 1. And, and, and we just recently as a church did a series in Romans. And if you call Wave Church your home and you miss this series, I would implore you to get on our Wave online app and, and consume this series. It was a powerful and practical series for us as a church. And we're going to take a look at a statement that Paul is the writer of Romans that Paul says in, in Romans chapter 1. And just to give some context to understand what we're talking about today because I believe it's important and in and, and, and Romans chapter 1 Paul because he hasn't met the church in Rome yet he expresses that he is eager to see them he has a heart to go see them and preach in person but Paul is introducing himself to the to the church in Rome is introducing his authority being an apostle the the pioneer of the of the early church I love the story of, of Paul his life mission at one point was to destroy Christianity he didn't like Christians he hated Christians and and, and he has an encounter with the presence of Jesus that that flips his life upside down and he becomes the pioneer of the early church I love the good news of this gospel amen. can I get an amen? amen and Paul is revealing his authority to the church in Rome and and this is just so we understand this this church in Rome, it's a small church, it's a newer church, it's insignificant in the eyes of society and of the government they're looked down on. And, and socially, this church is trying to live out their Christian faith in the midst of government resistance, cultural resistance. They're also dealing with division that not too long before this letter was written, the, the Jewish people were kicked out of Rome and they were kicked out of the church and then they're allowed back in and, and, and in the meantime the Gentiles started doing church the way that they, they like to, to do church they like to sing Hillsong and, and the Jewish people like to sing Bethel so they're arguing over what type of worship they want to have they're arguing over tradition they're arguing over food they're arguing uh, should we get more parking spaces they're arguing is, is are the screens big enough is the, the the carpet the right color there is there is division in the church. So Paul is bringing unity. He's bringing clarity. He's teaching tenets of, of faith. And, and, and then Paul says this statement that I believe is a, a marker and an indicator for our Christian progress. This is a statement as a follower of Jesus for me personally that I, I want to be able to say this statement and I want to be able to believe this statement. And I want to be able to live out this statement. Now, keep in mind, Paul has the audacity to say this statement in the face of the most powerful government at the time, the most cultural, powerful culture in the time, to a small, unstable, impoverished, living in the shadow of Roman strength, trying to figure it out, church. And it's in this context, Paul reminds the church in Rome that he wants to come preach in person. Paul is not concerned or worried about the risk of making the trip and preaching the gospel in, in Rome. Paul is not concerned with the consequences of living out this Christian faith because of this. This is what Paul says. This is the statement that Paul says that I want us to focus on today. Romans chapter 1. Y'all ready? Paul says this, For I am not ashamed of the gospel. I am not ashamed of of the gospel for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes to the Jew first and also to the Greek Paul's reminding him hey this gospel is for everybody yeah. then in verse 17 I don't know if we're gonna have time to to highlight this as much today but it says this for in it the righteousness of God how many people know our God is righteous yeah. our God is holy our God is perfect can I get an amen, amen. for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith the righteousness of God is revealed from Jesus so that you and I can live by faith for it is written the righteous shall live by faith I like the message translation it says this Paul says it's news I'm most proud to proclaim Paul says I'm proud to proclaim the good news of this gospel this extraordinary message of God's powerful plan to rescue everyone everybody who trusts him 
starting with Jews and then right on to everyone else. God's way of putting people right shows up in the acts of faith, confirming what scripture has said all along. The person in right standing before God by trusting him really lives. Why don't we pray? Jesus, we thank you for who you are. Holy Spirit of God, we thank you for your presence here today. God, we honor you. We worship you. God, what an honor it is to be able to gather in your church and this nation freely. Jesus, I thank you that you, you know every single human heart that is in this room. You are glad, you are smiling at the fact that every person is in church today. God, personally, I pray, I need your grace, your power, your authority, your anointing. I need, God, I need you. Help me to unashamedly preach your word today. And God, we just pray for the New York Jets and everybody said. Thank you, John. Everybody give it up for John. He's the man. Church, it's, it's that time of the year where two of my favorite things that I love dearly are back. Pumpkin spice at Starbucks. Don't judge me. And football. Anybody thankful that football is back? It also means, this also brings to the surface one of the most frustrating things about sports and about football, the bandwagon fan. They're the worst. I have somebody really close to me in my life. Typically, every family has a bandwagon fan, and I'm not going to say his name, but he lives in Dallas, and his name rhymes with Pam Jelly, and he's my little brother. And he's claimed more football teams than Tom Brady has rings. One of those teams being because he liked the colors of their uniform. Now you may be saying, Josh, you can't really talk because you cheer for Alabama football. And you couldn't even point out where Alabama is on a map if we gave one to you. This may be true, but I almost signed up for an online class at Alabama, Lydia, but golfing was not an option. And I've been a diehard Alabama fan for 4.25 years now, and it is a blessing to my life. Roll Tide, Pastor Robert Cameron. This is because I am also a suffering Jets fan. And for the first time, if there's any Jets fans, I doubt there is here today, for the first time in over a decade, we, we had hope in Aaron Rodgers. And I bought his jersey. And it didn't even fit, but I didn't care. And I got to wear his jersey for four plays before he tore his Achilles. Also tearing the hearts of all Jets fans and tearing our hope and our, our future. I've also torn my Achilles. It's just too personal. And so yes, I'm an Alabama football fan because I need victory in my life. I think what frustrates a real fan, though, a loyal, committed fan, is, is they know that a bandwagon fan has avoided the pain and the heartache and the suffering when their team was, was not good. You're a fan because it benefits you. I've been a fan when it did not benefit me. So even when we cheer together now that my team is good, when you celebrate, it does not contain the same weight and authority when I celebrate because I know the losses that it took to get here. All you know is, is the win. Church, if, if we're not careful, we can approach in modern Christianity, we can approach the gospel and we can approach the word of God in the same light. Where God, I'm, I'm unashamed of the gospel when I'm blessed. And I'm unashamed of the gospel when I'm prospering. And I'm unashamed of the gospel when it's convenient. And I'm unashamed of the gospel when he heals me. And I'm unashamed of the gospel when he answers my prayer. And I'm unashamed of the gospel when it's culturally acceptable. And I'm unashamed of the gospel when it's easy and when life is good. But there is one problem with approaching the gospel in this way. And that is we are not fans that are swayed by the game of life but we are disciples and we are followers and we are servants of King Jesus who are only swayed, who are only swayed by King Jesus and the outcome of the cross. I love Paul, he's saying, I'm unashamed of the gospel when I'm blessed and when I have nothing. 
I'm unashamed of the gospel when I'm prospering and when I'm in the wilderness. I'm unashamed of the gospel when God answers my prayer and when it feels like he is saying nothing. I'm unashamed of the gospel when he heals me and when he doesn't. I'm unashamed of the gospel when life is good and when life is hell. I'm unashamed of the gospel. Can I get an amen? Paul is saying, I am unashamed of the gospel, this good news of Jesus. And we live in a climate that has created a conundrum in Christian culture where too often we are embarrassed and we are ashamed and we are lacking confidence in the good news of Jesus. And when culture clashes our biblical conviction, instead of being unashamed, we blush. You ever been there? I have. Y'all still with me? And we got to consider who is saying this statement, this powerful statement, because it matters who's saying it. I'm unashamed of the gospel. When Paul says, I'm unashamed of the gospel, he says so with the authority of someone who is not a bandwagon disciple of Jesus but someone who knows what it is to suffer, to be mocked, to be persecuted for the sake of the gospel. Paul knows what it is to proclaim the good news when it was a benefit to him, and he knows what it is to proclaim the good news when it cost him everything. But what I want to know when I read this scripture is how is it that Paul has the audacity to say something like, I am unashamed of the gospel. No matter what, I am confident in the good news of of Jesus. We find the answer with what he says next, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. Church, Paul is reminding the followers in Rome and you and I today, this good news is not just nice information. It is not just a Sunday service and a nice sermon, but this gospel is saving, redeeming power. Can I get an amen? Amen. Paul has experienced the power of God, the power of God's saving work, the power of the work of the cross. It's not just a nice concept for Paul or a good way to live life. It is real. He is a man that knows what it is to be dead in his sin and for the power and the work of the cross to pick him up and change him and forgive him and give him grace and purpose in his life again. Can I get an amen? He has experienced the power of salvation. He is experiencing the power of salvation. And Paul continues to walk in the power of God. And and Paul proclaims this to the church in Rome because he knows living out this Christian life without the power of God, it's not easy to live with boldness and faith. It's not easy to live unashamed. Paul Paul knows the question will be asked of the church in Rome. The question will be asked by culture, why are you unashamed of the gospel? The good news, why are you unashamed of being a part of the church? Aren't aren't you embarrassed? Don't you want to be a part of, of cultural norms? Paul knows The church in Rome will be mocked. They will be persecuted. He knows, Paul knows this, that they will face consequences for living out their life of faith. Which, by the way, the consequences that they face were much more severe than consequences we face today. Paul knows it's easy to be unashamed of the gospel until it costs you something. It's easy to be unashamed of the gospel until it costs you. Paul teaches us following Jesus will inevitably ensure you stand out from culture. And we will either blush or we will be unashamed. Now, here's the thing, church. We're not trying to stand out. We're not looking for ways to clash with culture. But what I do know is a life of faith does not follow the way of the world and so church I propose to you and I this question today are we unashamed 
of the gospel. Think about that today. Or am I, am I unashamed of the gospel? How confident are you in the cross? Do we lack confidence in the gospel? Are we at times embarrassed or blushing because of this Jesus way of life? Church, I've been there. Think about Thomas, follower of Jesus, saw Jesus, life and ministry, see Jesus dying on the cross, and then he sees the resurrected Jesus in the flesh in front of his face, and he's still lacking confidence. Says, Jesus, I need, I, need to, I need to touch and see the scars. As I was praying over this, this text, researching this text, I came across an N.T. Wright commentary that, that pointed out four reasons Christians feel ashamed of the gospel today. Maybe one of these four things you can relate to wrestling with. Maybe as I bring up these four things today, maybe it's a little uncomfortable for some of us. Four reasons why maybe today Christians are ashamed of the gospel. Number one is this, the gospel reminds us we are spiritual failures. The gospel reminds me that I am a spiritual failure. Church, Jesus did not come for the good or the well-behaved. He came for the spiritually sick. You and me, those who have no spiritual potential and the only chance that I have to be saved is this free gift of grace. Church, this is, this is good news, but it also offends my pride. It offends the moral and the religious who think that their decency gives them an advantage. But the good news of this gospel, friend, is we are all spiritually sick. And we all need Jesus. And the only answer is Jesus. Can I get an amen? amen. The second reason the gospel doesn't just tell me I, it, it, we are ashamed of the gospel is this. The gospel doesn't just tell me I'm bad. It tells me I'm wicked. Did you know that? The gospel puts us all in the same boat. And outside of Christ, a life surrendered to Jesus, I am, I am so aware how profoundly wicked I am. So wicked that only Jesus could save me. And this offends my false thinking that deep down, you ever thought this, I, but I'm good. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a decent person. It clashes with the lie that we are inherently good. Which, by the way, if you want to just find out how inherently not good we are, have children. <laughs> and I love my kids. And it's the greatest privilege on earth to raise up my little kiddos in this crazy culture. I'm unashamed to raise them in God's house. But their first words were not, I love to share. And thank you. They were no mine. And some other words I won't repeat in church. So pray for my kids. The third reason Christians today maybe find themselves ashamed of the gospel is the gospel, this, this is one that in today's culture people wrestle with, the gospel tells me good people go to hell. The gospel tells me that good people go to hell. There is a cultural norm, even in the church, that thinks if you're good enough, you will be saved and forgiven and you can avoid hell. Yet the gospel truth is as jarring as it could be. Good, moral, decent behavior does not inherit the kingdom of heaven because deep down, none of us are good. And my best day, church, my goodest day is dirty rags before my perfect holy savior. Jesus did not come for nice people. And by all means, be nice. Some Christians have forgot that. Can I get an amen? <laughs> but Jesus did not come for nice people. He came to save sinners from hell. 
And he came to make the spiritually dead alive in Christ. Salvation is only through Jesus. Fourth reason, and this is a reason I think that we can relate to more in the Western world, is is this. The gospel tells us suffering is normal, not an exception. Friends, the gospel took place through the serving and suffering of Jesus. And if we are his followers, we can expect the same. Now, here's the thing. We're not seeking out suffering. I'm not trying to find ways to make life more difficult. But if Jesus suffered, if Jesus was persecuted, if Jesus was hated as his followers, we can expect the same at some point in our life. And this offends the lie that Christianity is just a nice, easy life. And I would like to propose the question, if my life is full of ease, am I really following Jesus? I hope and pray that there are times and there are seasons where there is ease. But if I'm, really with, if I'm really following Jesus, there are times when I walk through the valley of the shadow of death and his grace sustains me. Can I get an amen? amen. I think about my journey as a pastor's kid. And I think about this scripture in my life. And as I was writing this message, I was reminded of a time where I really wrestled with, am I, am I really unashamed of this gospel? And I love Jesus and I love church. When I was 17 years old, I was painfully aware that I was finding ways to blend in culture rather than Proclaim the good news of Jesus. At 17 years old, I remember my community group. That's why I love community groups. We made that decision that summer. So we're going to seek God more than we ever have before. And every week we would come right over here next to the church. It's my prayer spot. You can't pray there. It's mine. And we would pray. And I've shared this story before. I think I shared it early this year or last year. But I remember one night praying seeking God and encountering the power of his salvation, the power of his presence, encountering the presence of my my almighty God, realizing just how good he is, how good this news is, this grace that saved me from my my sin, I was ruined for anything else. And I began to wrestle with God. God, if you're this good, I can't keep it to myself. And I am tired of going to my high school that is full of young people desperate for hope. And I'm tired of blending in. And I think for the first time in my Christian walk, I surrendered everything to him. Specifically, even the call of God that was on my life. And I heard from heaven, Josh, I have called you. And I was like, I'm having this conversation with God in the presence of God. God, I want to be unashamed. I'll never forget the Holy Spirit specifically told me, he said, Josh, good, because I want you to start a Bible study in your high school. I said, God, I don't want to be that type of unashamed. I want to be another type. But I knew it was God. I knew the Holy Spirit had spoke to me. I went straight to my community group leader. His name's Josh Foy. I said, Josh, I got to tell you this because if I don't tell you, I'm going to keep it to myself and I don't know that I'm going to have the faith to do it. I'll never forget the first Friday in this public high school. Went into, we were going to do this every Friday. I was a senior every Friday, the fourth block. And I remember I went up to the security guard. Didn't really know him yet. His name's LB. And my plan was to ask LB if we could have this Bible study and, and maybe let people know, thinking that, that he would say no and I would be good. 
And I walk up to LB and said, hey, uh, my name's Josh, and we're just going to do a Bible study over here in the corner. So make sure that's okay with you. And, and, you know, maybe we'll tell people. And he hands me a microphone. He says, hey, cool. I said, since when did you have a microphone? So I don't think, I don't know if you heard what I said. I said, Jesus. He said, you didn't stutter. Here's the microphone. And so I get up in church. I am terrified. First real testing moment. Am I really unashamed of this gospel? Told everybody in the cafeteria, my name's Josh. I'm a Christian. Jesus changed my life. We've got pizza, which, which gets you into heaven. And, and it was as awkward as you can imagine. Crickets, a couple of laughs. Myself and three or four friends who were also Christians, one of them being Davey Dvorsky, who's our worship pastor. Everybody love Davey Dvorsky, by the way. <laughs> For the first four weeks, nobody came. No one. Just four little Christians in the corner talking about Jesus. I remember going back to this prayer spot. Davey and I would go back every Friday morning and pray, not because I wanted to, but because I needed to. God, I don't know if I can do this. God, I need you. Every Friday, I would be sick to my stomach, terrified to talk about Jesus again. And after four, I'm, I'm talking to God in my prayers. So I'm like, God, why would you ask me to come preach to Christians? Nobody's coming. So Josh, I've called you. And so we kept meeting and on, on about the fifth or sixth week. My dad asked me to preach for the first time on a Sunday night service. Some of you may have been there. It was not a good message. <laughs> and unbeknownst to me, LB was listening to that Bible study. And he was waiting to see if we'd be unashamed enough to keep showing up. And LB finds out what church we go to. And LB's first church service is the night that my dad asked me to speak, and when I give an opportunity for people to give their lives to Jesus, who is the first running to the altar? It's LB. <laughs> Try not to get emotional. Half the time preachers get emotional. I'm like, are you for real? <laughs> Little did I know LB would be the greatest evangelist in our school convincing, persuading students and teachers to come hear us talk about Jesus. By the end of that school year, around 40 young people would come over in that corner, eat pizza, and hear about Jesus. We prayed for people, we prayed for sick people, young people made decisions to follow Jesus. And I remember towards the end of the year, our principal came to church, he heard about what we were doing. Remember, by the end of the year, I'm thinking I'm doing a good job, and the Holy Spirit's reminding me. He said, Josh, there's something I asked you to do that you're avoiding. I want you at the end of the year to get up in front of everybody in that cafeteria and share the gospel. Now, here's the thing, church. I am not a fan of people doing this. I don't like people getting up and, and preaching when nobody asks them to. Like, if I go to a movie and you get up and start preaching, <laughs> I'm trying to watch Spider-Man. I want to hear about But there are times when the Holy Spirit speaks to you, when you're in line at 7-Eleven, you're at a work event, or you're at a gathering in your neighborhood and you know the Holy Spirit speaks to you and says, hey, share the gospel. Yeah. And this was one of those moments that I could not shake. So the last Friday of, of school, in that cafeteria, I'm gonna get up and share the gospel. I'll never forget the night before I am I am crying in my Nissan Pathfinder over in this prayer spot because I am terrified. I said, God, I don't know if I can do this. I said, Josh, I've called you. We, we walked into the cafeteria. My youth pastor came as well, and LB was more excited than we were. He got, had the microphone ready. And I get up to share the gospel. As soon as I start talking, this little pipsqueak stands up. I say pipsqueak because he was smaller than me, and that's small. And he starts cursing at me cursing at me, and I freeze in fear. I am blushing. I am embarrassed. Think to, thinking to myself, God, why? You knew this was going to happen. And before I could do anything, before David could do anything, one of the biggest football players in our school, he stood up. I didn't know he was listening to our Bible study the whole year. And he looked at me, he looked at the kid, he said, hey, kid, sit down and shut up. 
I remember thinking, yeah, kids, sit down, shut up, punk. <laughs> For the first time in my life, I felt over six feet tall, and I like it up here. I shared the gospel maybe for like 37 seconds. I was so nervous. I wish I could tell you people came running to my feet like, oh, who prophet we've been waiting for. <laughs> Couple of claps. I walked out of my school that day confident in the good news of the gospel. Four or five years later, a girl walks up to me, says, Josh, you don't know who I am today. I'm new to church just recently. I came to church because I was going through a really hard time in my life and I'd never been to church. And in this hard time of my life, I remembered there was this kid who stood up in my cafeteria, who told me that there's a church I could go to, that there's a savior Jesus who loved me, that cared for me. Josh, I came to church, I made a decision to follow Jesus because I think that kid, I think it was you And church, I know I am an insecure, reluctant pastor's kid who simply encountered the power of salvation. I experienced the almighty presence and the saving grace of Jesus that empowered me enough to be unashamed to stand up for a moment and proclaim the good news. You know what else I've found is the more that I read God's word and the more that I pray and the more that I dive my life into church community, the more unashamed I become of this good news of Jesus, the more aware I become of how good my God is, the more in awe and wonder I am that God would save me, that God would choose me, that God would call me. And the more that I have a desire to proclaim the good news. Can I get an amen? As we close, the band can come on up. I love what Paul says. Y'all still with me, by the way? I love what Paul says in Philippians 3. Paul says this, same writer, to the Philippian church, but whatever gain I had, I counted as lost for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as lost because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I had suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ. The righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. I love this. Not that I have already obtained all of this or already have arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that which Christ Jesus took a hold of me. Church, I wonder, has Jesus taken a hold of your heart? I'm not talking about information or goosebumps in a service. Has Jesus taken a hold of your life? Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do. I pray that we do this as a church, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead. There are those of us today and we need to forget about what is behind and it's time to move toward where God is calling you. Can I get an amen? Paul says, I press on toward the goal. I'm not just trying to be successful. By all means, be successful. But we press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. I pray that we are a community of disciples that keep pressing on toward the goal. That we don't just maybe raise our hand in church one day and attend church once a month and eventually die and go to heaven. I pray that we are a people 
who are growing in boldness and in our faith. And we are growing in how unashamed we are of the gospel. I pray that we aren't just a nice little group of Christians who have a nice service on Sunday and listen to some nice music and hear a nice sermon and have some nice conversations in a lobby, but yet we go home and the power of God is not in our Monday. I pray that we are unashamed. I pray that we are experiencing the power of salvation, the power of the Holy Spirit, that we surrender all of who we are to Jesus, that we are unashamed. When it doesn't make sense, I'm unashamed. When it costs me, we're unashamed. When I'm blessed, I'm unashamed. When I suffer, I'm unashamed. When I prosper, I'm unashamed. When I lack, I'm unashamed. I pray that we are confident in the work of the cross. Church, I pray that we are eager and we are passionate to proclaim the good news wherever we go. Oh, I pray that we remain unashamedly humble, knowing that we are not better than anyone else. We understand it's the kindness of God that leads people to repentance. Oh, I pray that we carry a zeal to share the gospel, to live out this life of faith, that we understand the gospel is for all who believe. Church, I pray that we unashamedly love people. I pray that we unashamedly are the church. May we be unashamed of our Savior who unashamedly took your shame on the cross. Church, please understand culture, the government, the enemy is going to reject, resist, and attack the gospel more and more. But I pray that we are a church no matter what happens around me, no matter what happens to me, I'm unashamed. We're unashamed. And I will not blush. I will not blush at the teaching of the Word of God. And I will not blush of the saving work of the cross. And I will not blush at this life of faith. Church, our world needs Jesus. Not a nice service not a nice sermon. Our world needs the saving power of Jesus. And Jesus is using his church. And the church is effective at spreading the good news of the gospel when the church is unashamed. Can I get an amen? amen? If you receive the word, can we give God a hand of praise today? Amen.